Hey, what's up, guys, and welcome to another episode of Q&A, the show where I take your questions and answer them here in video format. This is going to be answering all of your questions before the Browns' final, third and final preseason game um, in Atlanta. So we're taking all the questions. I'm excited to see what you guys have to say. So let's just kind of jump into it. And we're going to start with the first question from Michael Stone, who says, Hey, Q. Of all the rookies and players that were drafted last year, who do you think will be the greatest or have the greatest impact um, this year? Well, the easy answer is Jedrick Wills, right? Because he's the only one that's going to be like a key starter from that draft last year. If my recollection serves me proper, um, I could say there's going to be an argument for Jordan Elliott to kind of step up and then maybe Grant Delpit, even though I don't know where he's at with that hammy um, and if he's going to be ready for a big role early in the year. Um, but I do know that, you know, you just look at the rotation when it comes to defensive tackles and defensive ends. It's a lot of unsurety there, um, either it be injury or because we have kind of more patchwork solutions along the defensive line. Um, and I don't mean that in negative ways, just they have kind of done a lot of one-year contracts on the defensive line. So when it comes to that, I think maybe Jordan Elliott ha has the bigger opportunity just because he might see more snaps than a Grant Delpit um, or might be able to make more significant plays than a Grant Delpit. I don't know what the plan is for Grant Delpit. Is he just going to be a straight-up strong safety backup or free safety backup? Is he going to play and rover around? Like, I don't know what the plan is, partly because we just haven't seen him on the field very often um, throughout training camp because of the injuries that he has been dealing with. So, you know, I want to say Grant Delpit – but I'm probably going to go with Jordan Elliott. And then obviously there's Jedrick Wills. Next question comes from Biographies, who says, with JLK stock rising every day, where does Mac Wilson fall into play? I mean, like Mac Wilson, he's probably going to be a special teams guy and a, and a situational linebacker. Um, you know, maybe his stock rises if he continues to play well. Um, maybe he can, you know, be the long-term replacement and get a long-term deal to kind of replace uh, Anthony Walker, who has a one-year deal right now. So maybe that's the situation they can go with here uh, for Mac Wilson's future. But for right now, Mac Wilson's just worried about making the team once he does make the team, which is more likely than it was at the beginning of camp. Um, then it's kind of about figuring out what spot he's going to have. And I just don't know what that is for Mac Wilson at this point. When you look at JLK, when you look at Malcolm Smith and Anthony Walker and Sione Taki Taki, guys who have put in good work, um, three of the four in like the NFL uh, before, and JLK, who you spent a second round pick on, it's just going to be very hard to fit a fifth linebacker into that rotation. Um, so it's probably going to be special teams. The next question comes from Bradley, who says, do you think Demetric Felton will get used more this season in the offense than Anthony Schwartz this was an excellent question because they are both kind of gadget players that are going to be used in two completely different ways I kind of lean towards you're probably going to see a lot more of Demetric Felton despite him being a later draft pick um, because he can do more things than Anthony Schwartz can like and he's just had more practice reps, right? So when you talk about kick return, you know, Demetric Felton's probably going to factor into that if they don't keep uh, JoJo Natson. Um, same with punt return, right? And then, you know, there's just more situations to use um, Demetric Felton's ability to kind of be that extra running back. For example, and I don't think they're going to take Kareem Hunt out of this, but there are some situations like in a third and long where the Browns will go – and start with a running back in the backfield more than often it's Kareem Hunt and then that running back motions all the way out to the you know strong side of the field and plays that boundary wide receiver position I can see in a lot of situations maybe a handful of situations throughout the year that that back becomes Demetric Felton because if you're going to have somebody run boundary routes even though Kareem Hunt's really good at it um, I think Demetric Felton might be a tad bit better of a receiver of the football than Kareem Hunt um, just when we're talking about pure receiving skills so I think maybe in those areas you can see him there's just a lot more ways you can envision um, getting Demetric Felton on the field and getting the ball in his hands than you can can with Anthony Schwartz who you know maybe an end around and then you know maybe in a four vert you can get him on the field but other than that I really don't know what he can do because again he's one of those guys who just have not been on the practice field or been playing so you really just 
don't know what you should expect out of them, but we'll see. Next question comes from ENG, who says, um, Stefanski gave a lot of praise to Malik McDowell. How good are his chances to make the final roster? As good as any. Um, you know, the defensive tackle, look, that's the one spot on this team where there's not like four guys locked um, for making the roster. You got Billings, who's going to make the roster, um, barring that would be a surprise if he doesn't. You have uh, Malik Jackson, who's going to make the roster. And then, you know, Tommy Togia, who's a draft pick. And then Jordan Nellett, who was a third round pick the year before. And then, you know, you got two spots, um, essentially, to kind of open up. You know, maybe they keep four, maybe they keep six, but I do think you have about two extra spots there, and that could be Marvin Wilson, that could be Malik McDowell, that could be Sheldon Day, that can be literally anybody. So that's going to be interesting to watch. Malik McDowell, he does have an advantage over all those other names I stated because he can play a power end, he can play a rush end, and he can play inside. And again, former second round pick so he's gonna be coveted a little bit more than a Sheldon Day or, or somebody who's just kind of been a street free agent for the last couple of years so that's gonna be interesting to watch I don't know what his chances are making the roster but he has had a good preseason so far so they're as good as any right the next question comes from Wes B who says what's good Q do you think Baker and Beckham truly developed their chemistry this year I think there's a good chance that they just get in rhythm this year um you know I think a lot of, of of the awkwardness from the last two years were two players not being sure where each other was going to be in the offense um one year because the offense was just a complete mess the other year um because they just weren't sure of the offense yet they were at the beginning stages of learning an offense um and it kind of threw them off rhythmically i think once you get more reps in they, they can get that thing together, and they'll be much better together. There's no reason, and I, I want to go back to this, but there's no reason to believe Baker Mayfield cannot perform with Odell Beckham. And honestly, if you're saying that Odell or Baker, my bad, um, can't perform with Odell Beckham on the field, then you're telling me that the Browns really shouldn't be looking to extend Baker just because, you know, if Baker can't perform with good wide receivers around him, and he needs a lesser wide receiving core, then you're just putting a limit on what this team can achieve, if that's truly what you think. I, on the other hand, just don't think that Baker is that weird or that bad of a quarterback that he can't perform with a premium wide receiver. I see no reason why he couldn't. He did it at um, Oklahoma quite well. I don't know why it would be that much different in the NFL, um, unless you're going to hit me with all these like bad faith, oh, well, Odell's going to be a diva and cry about the ball takes when Odell has never been a diva and not cried about not getting the ball in his two years here. So I'm not here for any of that, um, if that's what you're going to come at on why it's different for Baker Mayfield. But again, Baker Mayfield, he's a good enough quarterback um, at this point in his career to where he can handle having a premium wide receiver. And if he can't, then that makes you have to reevaluate what you think about Baker Mayfield more so than it does about Odell, to be honest with you. The next question comes from a tool who says, um, hey, Quincy, I've been seeing a lot of people in the national media compare Baker Mayfield to Gardner Minshew, saying that they're very similar um, to each other in stats-wise. Baker is Minshew on a better team. What's your take on this? This is a peak, peak preseason football take that I'm hearing from a lot of people about the whole Baker Mayfield Gardner Minshew thing. It's a take you can really only get away with when people cannot actively watch both Baker Mayfield and Gardner Minshew play in a football game, right? Because if you could watch Baker Mayfield and Gardner Minshew play in a football game, you'll go, wow, Baker Mayfield's much better than Gardner Minshew. Oh, my goodness, he's so much better than Gardner Minshew. But since you cannot, and you can throw a handful of stats out there and make them seem like, oh, well, they're just both the same guy, even though it's very misleading, right? Splits do exist, and there are different splits that matter more than other splits. But again, cumulative stats are what they are. They're very flawed. Um, but yeah, you can throw that statistical argument out there, but come on. Like, nobody in their right mind that watches football can actually really think that. Like, Gardner Minshew and Baker Mayfield don't have the same arm strength. They don't have the same mobility. Um, Baker Mayfield is much, 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 much more accurate on a throw-by-throw -throw basis, and he makes more difficult throws than Gardner. Like These are things 
that you lose sight of as these games go away and we get into the offseason and the preseason where we're not playing football, you know, it always brings me back, and this might be a weird example, but it was the year Teddy Bridgewater. It was 2014, right? Teddy Bridgewater ended the college football season as the number one overall pick, right? Everybody's saying Teddy Bridgewater is the best quarterback in this draft. He ended up being the 32nd overall pick and getting drafted behind Johnny Manziel. When we were watching football, there was no way anybody really believed Johnny Manziel was going to be the number one overall pick or the first quarterback taken. But we got so far away from football and into all of these silly things and, you know, people chopping up stats and and presenting them to you in this way or that way and making their arguments, whether they be good or bad faith, to the point to where we got to a place where Johnny Manziel got drafted before Teddy Bridgewater. It just reminds me that the further away we get from the actual games or the closer we get because there's been an absence of games, um, the more and more people become susceptible to arguments that they would not be if they were just watching football and the games were happening, right? So the context can be eroded at times, which can lead to people actually saying, Gardner Minshew and Baker Mayfield are very similar players. Again, notice, these takes don't come out during the season when they're both playing football and when you can watch them both. They only come out during the offseason. That tells you a lot about certain takes when they only come out during the offseason. Um, the next question comes from Timothy, who says, Q, what's this crazy talk about trading Kareem Hunt? He's super valuable. Why would anybody want to trade him? They're not going to trade Kareem Hunt. Um, you know, I don't know where these rumors are coming from. I try to stay away from all the the Twitter rumors because they genuinely and a hundred percent are never reliable outside of a handful of sources um, that are out there that have been consistently reliable and true um, on their Twitter feeds. A lot of the other stuff is just complete junk. So, you know, I'm not really uh, somebody who pays attention to the Twitter rumor spear, but if this is flying around, you know, they're not trading Kareem Hunt. It makes absolutely no sense to trade Kareem Hunt, partly because Kareem Hunt doesn't have as much trade value as a lot of people think. Like, yeah, he's a great running back, but, you know, if you're a GM, you're going to nag that price down because he hasn't had the, you know, premium running back yards, and you're probably going to nagle it down to like a fifth or fourth round pick um, for Kareem Hunt. And that's if you're lucky. So the trade value just isn't there to make sense for the Browns to trade him and I also don't see why somebody would trade for a running back at this point of year when people genuinely believe that you can find decent enough running back play um, at the end of the regular well preseason um, through waivers the next question comes from Brandon Ward who says with Billings playing so poorly in the preseason he looks like a liability could you see one of the D tackles starting early in the year until Billups is in better football shape now look I know I've been rough on Andrew Billings but he shouldn't be counted out just because he's had a bad preseason. Like, multiple players have had bad preseasons and just turned it around the regular season. My only concern with Billings and how he's playing is if that's the solution and that's how he's playing, then I have to point it out and I have to mention that if that's the case, I don't really see how this defensive line, at least in the interior, is going to be an upgrade from last year. That being said... I think we got to give Billings at least a few games into the regular season before we're talking about him being a complete liability. But nonetheless, thank you for the question, Brandon. But that's it for this week's questions. Again, guys, thank you for asking them. If you want to make sure you can ask a question for the next show, make sure you're subscribed and notified. I put out prompts. Um, and if you're subscribed and notified, you'll get a notification when those question prompts come out. Another way to see if you can ask questions is follow me on Twitter at Quincy. Links are in the description down below. Sometimes I ask for questions on Twitter. But again, guys, I want you guys to have a great day. Have a good night.